Hey everybody, Photo Joseph here, Lumix Ambassador, and there has been a huge update just announced for the Lumix S1 and S1R, as well as the Lumix GH5, GH5S, and G9. I'm gonna take you through a list of what all these new features are that we can expect to see coming up on November 19th. I've also built a webpage on my website at photojoseph.com slash November 2019 Lumix firmware updates, or just click up here, that'll take you there as well, or click down below. And on my website, I have all this information laid out as it comes from Panasonic, as well as a comparison chart, because one of the big things you're gonna see here is just how many new features have been added to the G9 and we're gonna be talking about how it compares now to the GH5. But let's get started with the updates, starting with the S1 and the S1R. The first new feature is compatibility with the CF Express Type B cards, giving you a theoretical performance of 2000 megabit per second. And just to kind of put that in perspective, compared to a V90 card, something we have talked about and looked at before on the show, a V90 card is 90 megabytes per second, which translates to 720 megabit per second. So. Again, theoretically, and even the word theoretically is in the press release, the new cards will be able to go even faster. Now, the video capabilities of the S1 and the S1R do not exceed the needs of the V90. So at this point, really what it comes down to is both clearing the buffer faster when you're shooting stills, and of course, copying files off of the card more quickly to your computer. Next is a big one. This is the Profoto TTL wireless transmitter support, and that is the Profoto Air Remote TTL O slash P, that's Olympus slash Panasonic. And as I understand it, there are current hardware on the market that will be able to get an update. I don't know if there's gonna be a new version that actually has the P in the name listed on it, but this transmitter will allow you to do full TTL photography using the Profoto lights. And in fact, for those of you who follow me on social media, know that I was in New York recently and I was actually shooting a video around this. And you'll be seeing that sometime in the next couple of weeks. There are compatibility enhancements for Sigma products. So there are, of course, the Sigma L mount lenses. You will now be able to assign functions to the FN buttons on those lenses. Plus there are in-body image stabilization improvements when using the MC21. The Sigma MC21 is the EF mount adapter to L mount, which is designed to be used with Sigma lenses. But in my testing, it is the best adapter for any Canon lens to be used on the L mount. And it's one I currently have sitting behind me here. Next up is compatibility with the upcoming 70 to 200 f 2.8 lens, simply allowing you to program the custom function buttons on this. So this is just something for hardware that is about to be released. There are some autofocus improvements. You can now use autofocus plus manual focus when in autofocus continuous mode. That's the feature where after focus has been achieved, you can move the manual focus ring on the lens to adjust focus without actually having to switch into manual focus mode. Historically, you've only been able to do that in autofocus single mode. You can now do that in autofocus continuous as well. The next one reads as set continuous autofocus on live view screen. And to be honest, this took a little while to figure out exactly what this means, but we got it. So on the Lumix S1H, there are two continuous autofocus modes when shooting video. One mode only does continuous autofocus when you're actively recording, and the other does it all the time, whether you're recording or not. Now, all of these cameras have always enabled continuous autofocus even when not recording when an HDMI monitor or recorder has been connected, but now you have the ability to have that turned on all the time, no matter what. You now also have manual exposure in high-speed video recording, where previously you only had automatic exposure when you're shooting in high-speed video. Now you have manual exposure. Next is a little one, select card slot for JPEG developed in camera. This is a function that I don't know how many people use, but if you're shooting raw only in your camera and you decide that you want to develop a JPEG and you wanna process that in camera, which means you can choose your color profile, you can adjust highlights and shadows, white balance and other things, and then have the camera generate a JPEG file, you can now apparently choose where that file gets saved. The next feature is called check aperture effect aka depth of field preview with an FN or a function button. Now previously what we've had is when you push the button to do the preview, it toggles between off, aperture preview, which gives you your depth of field preview, and shutter effect preview, which shows you any kind of motion blur that you would be getting from that shot. And then you press it again and it disables it. Now there is a function that only does the aperture preview. So this is really more like a traditional depth of field preview button where you push it to check your depth of field and release it to release that. You can set the camera to disable any physical operation with one of the function buttons. 
There is an autofocus assist light that has been added to the focus tab when in the video menu. And the luminance levels of photos can be set on playback over the HDMI output. The exposure can be locked with the autofocus slash auto exposure lock button when the ISO is in auto and the camera is in manual mode. So if you were in manual shutter, manual aperture, but auto ISO, previously pressing that auto exposure lock wouldn't lock the ISO in place, now it does. Specifically to the S1, if you have the V-Log update installed, there have been fringe cases where a super saturated blue color would clip in the V-Log recording. That has been improved, as well as an even more fringe thing, which I've actually never seen myself, where you could get an after image on your V-Log recording, basically a ghost or an echo. That apparently has been addressed as well. Now let's get into what's new for the GH5, GH5S, and G9. There's gonna be some repeats here, so I'll gloss over those, but let's get started. That Profoto TTL wireless transmitter is also compatible with the G-Series cameras. There is improved autofocus performance, specifically on the GH5S and G9. Animal detection has been added, and you can change the focus subject with the joystick. If you haven't experienced this before, when you're looking through the camera at multiple potential subjects, so maybe multiple people or animals, each face will be outlined with a box that you can then tap on and choose that as the primary, and that person, that individual, becomes what the camera is tracking. You can now jump between those selected boxes by using the joystick on the back of the camera. On all three cameras, the GH5, the GH5S, and the G9, they're adding autofocus near shift and autofocus far shift. Essentially, the idea is if you are in a scenario where there's a lot of stuff in front of you and farther away, and the camera might be unsure of which it should focus on, by programming one of your FN buttons to be either near shift or far shift, you are essentially telling the camera to ignore the stuff in the foreground and focus on what's in the back or vice versa. That has now been added to the G-Series cameras. You now also get focus peaking in autofocus modes. Focus peaking is that really critical feature when you're in manual focus that allows you to know exactly what's in focus by showing lines over the in focus areas in camera. You now have the ability to enable that while in autofocus, which is great. This means that if you're especially looking on a smaller monitor and you're relying on autofocus in the camera, this will allow you to critically know whether the camera has actually achieved focus or not. Finally, you can also set continuous autofocus on the live view screen, which is the same thing we talked about before, where autofocus is always happening, whether the camera is recording or not, even if it's not connected to an HDMI output. Let's take a quick break here. It's a lot of information to remind you to subscribe if you haven't already. I would certainly appreciate that. I will be covering all of these features in depth as they actually come out. I'll be doing another video on how to install them, and we'll be looking at some of the features inside of the camera, some of the things that are worth looking at up close. So be sure you subscribe so you know about that when it comes, and uh, hit that like button as well, will you? Appreciate that. All right, let's get back to it. Now we get into some of the biggest announcements. This is specifically for the G9, and for those of you who own a G9 and are shooting video, you're gonna be very, very happy with these. First up, 4K 30p or 25p, if you're working with a PAL camera, 422 10-bit, internal recording. Let's repeat that again. 4K, 422, 10-bit internal recording on the G9. That's something we previously had on the GH5 and GH5S that is now coming to the G9. You also now get 4K 60p, or 50p in PAL, 422, 10-bit on the HDMI output. Again, something we only had previously on the GH5 and GH5S. To go along with 10-bit recording is 10-bit luminance levels, so that's 0 to 1023 levels. And VFR or variable frame rate shooting is now supported. That means instead of just having high speed shooting, you get true variable frame rate. So when you're shooting in HD, you can shoot between two and 180 frames per second. If you're shooting 4K, you can ramp from two to 60 frames per second. You now also get HDR or HLG, hybrid log gamma video recording inside of the G9. And finally, one of the biggest features, Vlog L is now coming to the G9 you will be able to, through a paid upgrade, just like you could for the GH5, add Vlog L to your G9. You can now purchase that for about $100 and add Vlog L recording to your G9. So this is absolutely huge, really taking the G9 up to a whole new level. So at this point, you might be wondering, well, what are the differences between the GH5 and the G9? We'll get to that, but first I wanna throw out a few other new features that are being added. Just a quick rapid fire of a few new things. You now have auto white balance W or warm added to your auto white balance settings. 
you have exposure offset adjustment, which allows you to offset the exposure for any of the different metering modes. So let's say, for example, that whenever you shoot center weighted, you find that you're always over or underexposing it by a certain amount. You can now pre-program that in. So whenever you pull it up, it is always offset by that amount. You now have a half second duration in the auto review. So if you want your photo that you just shot to basically just flash on screen for a split second before going away, so you can continue shooting, you now have that option. As we saw in the S1, the exposure can be locked with the AFA lock button when you're in auto ISO in a manual shooting mode. A mode has been added to the live view boost function, basically increasing the frame rate, allowing you to focus more easily when you're doing manual focus in the live view boost and specifically to the G9 when you're shooting in the high resolution mode. That's where the sensor shifts to allow you to stitch together a higher resolution image than the sensor can do on its own. There is mode two now, which compensates for motion in the scene. Finally, the new Lumix Sync app, which was launched for the S series cameras, is now going to be compatible with the G series as well, the GH5, GH5S, and G9. Okay, so let's talk about comparing the GH5 to the G9. We've just seen some major, major updates for the G9. So how does it stack up to the GH5 now? Well, a while ago, I did a comparison video comparing the two cameras, and I've taken that same chart and updated it now with the new features. So as we go through the chart, whatever you see in red is the winner between any two categories. And if you see something in yellow, that's denoting that it is a new capability. Both cameras have the same 20.3 megapixel live MOS no low pass filter sensor. Both could do ISO ranges from 200 to 25,600 or down to 100 in the extended ISO. Both have 6K photo mode, giving you 18 megapixel images at 30 frames per second. Both cameras are splash dust and freeze proof down to minus 10 degrees Celsius or 14 degrees Fahrenheit. Both have dual UHS-2 slots and both have battery grips available. Of course, the G9 still has that status LCD on top of the camera. The firmware update can't change that. So if you like that status LCD, consider the G9. The viewfinder in the G9 is still a bit better. It has multiple zoom functions, which is really good if you're wearing eyeglasses. It allows you to zoom out of the frame so it basically gets a little bit smaller in frame while you're wearing glasses so you don't have to take off your glasses to put your eye right up to the frame. And it is also a higher frame rate viewfinder. The LCD, however, on the GH5 is a little bit higher resolution and a little bit more color accurate. Dimension-wise, they're basically the same, and the weight of the G9 is slightly less at 658 grams, bringing it uh, 70 grams or two and a half ounces lighter than the GH5. The price is definitely something to talk about. Retail prices on the left and the current street price in parentheses. So at the moment, the GH5 retails at $19.98, but can be bought on B&H for $13.98, while the G9 retails at $14.98, but can be currently picked up for just $11.98. Considering all the new features that are being added to this, this makes this a heck of a deal. This is a phenomenal camera. The G9 has the high resolution photo mode that we just saw a new feature added to. That mode does not exist on the GH5. Autofocus in the G9 is a little bit faster. Now by this chart, you're seeing it's at 0.04 seconds versus 0.05, which doesn't seem like much. But actually when it comes to video, the G9 is a better autofocusing camera. It is simply a newer camera with newer processor in it. It's just a bit more advanced. It's just the way it is. You have a faster electronic shutter speed up to 132 thousandth of a second on the G9 and you have higher burst rate mode. So if you are shooting stills, then this is something very important to consider. In autofocus single mode, you can shoot up to 60 frames per second, and those are raw files, raw photos. This is not the 6K or 4K photo mode. So true raw full resolution files, 60 frames per second in autofocus single or manual focus, of course. Or if you're shooting autofocus continuous, you can shoot up to 20 frames per second. The dual image stabilization in the body and lens gives you an extra stop and a half of stabilization on the G9, which is pretty great. Movie formats, now we're getting into some of the things that have been added. The G9 now has MOV. The GH5, of course, already had that, but now that has been added to the G9. Oh, for sake, the fly. I think I got it. When shooting in 4K60 on the GH5, you do have unlimited recording time. That's 4K60, 4208 bit at 150 megabit internal. The same format is available on the G9, but it is only up to 10 minutes long. When shooting 4K30, you have a couple of additional advantages on the GH5. You have cinema 4K mode, which is a slightly wider than ultra HD mode. 
Plus you have the all intra codex at 400 megabit, whereas on the G9, you are shooting at 422 10-bit in a long op format at 150 megabit. So while you are getting 422 10-bit recording in the G9, the 422 10-bit recording in the GH5 is slightly better. Plus you have unlimited recording on the GH5, which you don't have on the G9. The variable frame rate features now are the same between the cameras and the HDMI output is the same on both cameras as well. There are a couple of exceptions, which we'll get into later on, but as far as the actual output signal at 422 10-bit 60p, that's the same on both. And finally, the Vlog L upgrade is now available on both cameras. So now let's talk about what is specifically unique to the GH5, what makes it different from the G9, and don't worry, we'll talk about the G9 unique features as well. The GH5 has unlimited recording. It is a true multi-format camera, allowing you to switch between NTSC, PAL, and the Cine mode. That's the true 24P. So if you are looking for 24P, not 2398, we're talking about 24.00 frames per second, the GH5 is still the camera to buy. You have Cinema 4K on the GH5. You have anamorphic support, which includes the de-squeeze functions in camera, of course. You can set the GH5 to shutter angle, which also means that you have synchro scan. So if you need to adjust your shutter angle in one degree increments to synchronize with, for example, an LCD display, you can do that on the GH5. You have master pedestal controls and you have the vector scope on the GH5. On the G9 with the V-Log upgrade, you do get the waveform, but you don't get the vector scope. You have the focus transition feature, which allows you to set multiple points to focus between and to choose the speed that you move between them. So it's essentially focus racking built into the camera. That's unique to the GH5. You have the all intra codex, as we discussed earlier. You have time code support on the GH5, which does give you another function we'll come up to in just a moment. You have a color bar generator in the GH5. You have XLR1 support on the GH5, which could be a big deal if you wanna be able to connect an XLR microphone directly to your camera. The GH5 is still the one for that. And because of the time code support, you also have HDMI out recording control. So for example, if you hooked up a Atomos recorder to your GH5, you push the shoot button or the record button on the GH5, that can trigger the recorder. That's not something you can do with the G9. You also have HDMI out LUT display. So while as far as we know, and I don't yet have the G9 Vlog L upgrade installed on my G9, as far as I know, we will still be able to load LUTs into the camera. However, we do know that you cannot put that LUT on the HDMI out to display that out on your external monitor. However, most external monitors allow you to load a LUT directly into them, so it's probably not really that big of a deal. And finally, a little thing, but there is the video priority layout on the GH5, which you don't have on the G9. This simply rearranges the display on the LCD to be more video focused as opposed to photography focused. So now what's different about the G9? What does the G9 do that the GH5 does not? First up, the G9 does have superior autofocus. Again, as said before, it's a little bit faster. It's got the newer processor. It's just overall better autofocus. You have the higher frames per second for still photography. You have the night mode where everything in the display goes red, which is great if you're shooting at night a lot. This allows you to not lose your night vision just because you're looking through the viewfinder on the camera. You have the autofocus point scope function. The USB power supply function allows you to power the camera with an external USB battery. Instead of having to use the dummy battery that goes into the GH5, this allows you to use a USB power brick to power your camera. There are dual burst mode presets. This is simply the physical setting on top of the camera, a switch that allows you to go between setting one and setting two, and you can program those to be whatever you want. So for different types of burst shooting scenarios, maybe one that's electronic shutter at a super high frame rate, and one that's mechanical at a lower frame rate, you can program those into a physical switch on the G9. There's the FN lever, the function lever. This is just another function control that is a physical switch on the front of the G9 that allows you to enable or disable any settings you like. Like for example, to switch it into silent mode or to enable the red night mode are two good use cases for that. And finally, improved JPEG color rendering on the G9. What this basically means is that your JPEGs coming out of the G9 should look a little bit better than the ones coming out of the GH5. So there you have it. That is everything. It's a lot. This is a huge update especially for G9 users, but for all of the cameras, there are some pretty significant features being added in here. These updates will be available again on November 19th, and I encourage you to visit my website at the URL that is linked below to get all of this information in one place. You'll have a text version of everything we just talked about, including the comparison chart, and of course, links to where to find those updates. So what do you think? 
What do you think about this update? Is this a big one? Is this something you're excited about? Let me know in the comments below. Let me know if this makes you want that G9 or that S1 or the GH5 even more than before. And of course, if you have one of these cameras, I look forward to hearing how the update works out for you as soon as you install it.